The room wasn't completely dark. The curtains were drawn, and a single lamp offered a dim glow. I could have watched TV or indulged in a drink, but I wasn't in the mood. After showering and shaving, I slipped into my most comfortable clothes, knowing I needed to be ready for what promised to be a long night. Staying sober was crucial, even if the temptation to get dead drunk lingered. I was exhausted from a busy day, both physically and emotionally. Sitting on the couch, I replayed the events in my mind, trying to discern where I might have gone wrong, only to realize that I hadn't. She was the one who cheated. It was her fault, not mine. Yet I was the one left to pick up the pieces. Twelve years of marriage, gone in an instant. At least we didn't have kids. Our hopes for a family ended three years ago, when Ellie had a tragic miscarriage. It devastated us both, but I never thought it would drive her to an affair. I kept my eyes on the clock, wondering who would arrive first, my unfaithful wife or someone from one of the many agencies ensuring peace and order in the D.C. area. Could be the FBI, CIA, local or state police, or even Homeland Security. A cold beer would have been nice. Living in the farmhouse in Warrenton had its perks, far enough from the city to avoid much of the political chaos. A year after the miscarriage, Ellie landed a job as a publicity agent for a political lobbying firm. Every day she commuted across the Beltway, occasionally grumbling but overall energized by the work. Initially, she was enthusiastic about her job, sharing stories of the intriguing people she met. I always listened, attentive to her excitement. However, by the second year, I noticed a troubling pattern. One particular contact, a mutual acquaintance she never mentioned, appeared frequently. Richard Taylor, a senator from our home state of Indiana, had been our friend since college. We had attended the University of Indiana with him and his wife, Amelia. Although Richard's rising political career had created some distance, we still exchanged Christmas cards. Ellie's firm handled Richard's publicity and constituent communications. Over the past year, I'd seen numerous photos and short TV clips where Ellie was in the background with Richard, smiling. While her presence might go unnoticed by most, it was glaringly obvious to me. She never once mentioned seeing or speaking to Richard, which felt ominously unusual. I mainly worked from home and seldom ventured into the D.C. area. I ran a modest yet thriving business managing retirement accounts for small companies with fewer than 100 employees. With most competitors focusing on larger clients, I found a niche market. Though I wasn't earning a fortune, I was comfortable and enjoyed the flexibility of working without an office staff. It was easy to spiral into paranoia about my situation and harder to discern reality from my imagination. Hiring a private detective to investigate a U.S. senator was out of the question. I simply couldn't afford it. In desperation, I purchased three small, handheld GPS units that recorded my wife Ellie's driving routes during her workday. With a battery life of 11 hours, they tracked her movements around the Beltway and into Alexandria. I didn't intend to physically follow her through DC traffic. Instead, I planned to use one device each day for three days, then review the data over the weekend to see if any suspicious patterns emerged. The GPS units exceeded my expectations. Within the first three days, Ellie made two stops at the executive suite apartments near Reston. It wasn't difficult to discover that Suite 214 was leased by U.S. Senator Richard Taylor. Whether Ellie stayed for a brief period or longer didn't really matter. The betrayal was evident. I could have confronted her, giving her a chance to explain, but I chose not to. Over the next few days, I left home after Ellie and drove to Reston, where I found a secluded spot to wait. On the second day, Senator Taylor arrived in a black Mercedes, followed by Ellie ten minutes later. They stayed inside for over two hours before leaving separately. My marriage was effectively over, and it was time to plan my next steps. Three different companies offered to buy my business. I sold it quietly and moved the money into a long-term offshore account. The mortgage on our house exceeded its current value, so I decided to abandon it. Nothing else seemed to matter. Using Tuesday's rendezvous as a reference, I spent all day Monday preparing. By 4 o'clock, I had printed letters, addressed envelopes, and prepared over 200 stamped mailings. Everything went according to plan the next day, which was today. 
First, I attached a bright orange smoke flare to Richard's car ignition, rendering it unusable until cleaned. Then, I cut the valve stems on Ellie's tires. Before heading back home, I mailed all the envelopes. Phase one was complete. Ellie arrived home before any of the federal agents I was expecting. She shrugged off her coat as she entered the room, dropping her purse onto the side table with a definitive thud. She cast a fleeting glance my way but said nothing. Finally, she settled in a chair opposite me and let out a heavy sigh. I had to get one of the girls from work to give me a ride home. I remained silent, unmoving. That was a pretty drastic thing to do, George. How did she know it was me? It could have been a vandal or someone with a political grudge. Still, I gave no response. You could have said something. Why did you have to do that? Why didn't Richard give you a ride home? You know damn well why. We had to get both cars towed. Sorry if I caused you any inconvenience. There were police, reporters, even two TV crews. I know. I called them. You son of a bitch. That was horrible and inconsiderate. Richard is up for re-election. If the truth comes out, it'll tank his chances. I hope so. She fought back tears but was losing the battle. Ellie, what was I supposed to do? You were cheating on me with someone I counted as a friend. Does Amelia know? No, of course not. Hopefully, she'll never find out. They have three children, George. Do you understand what this could do to their family? Oh, that's just the beginning. Things are going to get much worse over the next few days. How? How could it possibly get worse? Well, for starters, the police will be here for me shortly. Why? Neither Richard nor I ever mentioned your name. What did he tell the authorities? He said it was someone who disagreed with his political views. That threw a wrench in my plans. I had expected to be hauled off to some interrogation facility. George, can we talk about this? Don't I get a chance to explain? No, I stood up and headed for the kitchen. If the police weren't coming, I would have myself a beer. Ellie, I don't want to know what you did, why you did it, or when. It doesn't matter. You can move out or stay. I don't care. Just don't try to justify it. I walked out to the front porch. The air was unseasonably chilly. The beer was refreshing, though coffee might have been better. I had no intention of reconciling and no desire to understand her actions. I simply didn't want to know. As I stepped back inside, I noticed that Ellie had retreated to the bedroom and shut the door behind her. Grabbing another beer, I settled once more onto the sofa, bracing myself for a long night ahead. An hour elapsed before my wife reappeared in the living room. Tear stains marred her face as she cautiously took a seat in the chair nearest to me, twisting her hands in her lap. George, what did you mean when you said things were going to get worse? Ellie asked, her voice tinged with worry. I sent a letter to Amelia today, I replied, my tone flat, and I didn't just stop there. I mailed 221 copies to every newspaper, radio, and TV station around. Every U.S. senator has one, along with the FBI, CIA, NSA, and Homeland Security. I made sure both our families received a copy, as well as everyone on our Christmas card list. Each commentator on FOX TV got their own. Oh, and your boss and colleagues received one too. Oh God, no. What kind of letter? Who's going to believe an accusation from a madman? Do you even have solid proof, or are you still guessing? You're going to look like a fool, George. Worse, I countered. They'll call me demented and crazy. But do you think I care? I have no life left and nothing to look forward to. If I'm going down, I'm not going down alone. I think you're overestimating the impact of your letter. Public figures get these kinds of letters all the time. They have a special place for them. Then maybe I wasted my time. I guess that's good news for you and Richard. Anyway, I'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. I pulled the afghan from the back of the sofa, starting to make myself a bed. Can I at least see the letter? She asked. I went to the desk and retrieved a sheet of paper from the top drawer, handing it to her. It was brief, and she read it quickly. Oh no, George, please tell me you didn't send this. She slumped back into the chair, 
the letter fluttering to the floor as fresh tears streamed down her face. Dear Amelia, if Richard sees or even contacts Ellie one more time, your children could get hurt. You know what I mean, your friend, George Nelson. It was the sort of thing only a madman would write. Of course, I hadn't meant a word of it, but the shock value was necessary. I knew I would be apprehended once the letter made its rounds, and I was prepared for the fallout. A threat to a U.S. senator's family would demand attention, unlike the ramblings of a wronged husband. Ellie staggered back to the bedroom, leaving me alone. The earliest mail delivery would be around 9 in the morning. I figure I had one more night before everything spiraled out of control. I awoke early the next morning, grateful to find a razor in the car, which I used on my way to the nearest diner. I ordered the breakfast special and picked up a pack of gum on my way out, wishing for a toothbrush but settling for what I could get. I tried to kill as much time as possible, knowing that eventually, I would need to head back home and face the consequences of my actions. When I arrived home, a black sedan and a state trooper's car were parked out front. I never made it to the door. Ellie stood on the porch in her bathrobe as FBI agents and a state trooper escorted me away. For the next few days, I was either being interrogated or left to cool my heels. The excitement surrounding the letter largely passed me by. Although no charges were filed, the term radical threat was frequently invoked. Throughout the ordeal, I experienced a strange sense of contentment, finding the attempts to intimidate or scare me rather amusing. Since my detention, I hadn't heard from Ellie. Bail was never mentioned, nor did I see a lawyer. Instead of being relocated to an actual jail or prison facility, I was held in a secure area of a federal building. Though isolated, I wasn't abused or mistreated. It soon became apparent that people were trying to maneuver around me, avoiding direct confrontation. Contrary to my expectations, no charges were pressed. Evidently, my planning had been lacking. With no other options, I went with the flow, never requesting legal representation, and none was offered. I had anticipated a visit from my wife, but it never came. Instead, Richard's wife, Amelia, came to see me. They left us alone in a small room, free of restraints and guards, though I suspected there were listening devices and a large one-way mirror on the wall. Hi, George, she greeted me. I can only nod, feeling terrible for what I had done to her and unsure how to make amends. Can I get an explanation or something similar, she asked. I'm sorry, Amelia. The best I can do is offer you an apology. What I did was foolish, but I was desperate. I never intended to hurt you or the kids, and I think you know that. It was the only way I could get any attention. That was important to you, she asked. I couldn't compete with Richard, and you know that, I replied. He's powerful, rich, and charismatic. I hated losing Ellie to him and felt powerless to retaliate for the pain he caused me. Well, you seem to have done a damn good job, she said, looking at me quizzically. Richard was called back to Indiana to sit with the state Democratic committee and discuss this recent incident. George, this wasn't the first time he screwed up, but it's the first time his team couldn't cover it up. Political backers have ways of keeping things clean, but your blitz threw a wrench in their plans. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? At this point, I believe Richard's political career is finished. That's fair, considering my marriage is too. Amelia gave me a weak smile. George, I need a favor. After what I did to you, you're asking me for help? What can I possibly do for you? I'm planning to divorce Richard and wondered if you had any proof of his affair with Ellie. Sorry, I can't help you. All I know is Richard leased a condo in Reston where they used to meet. I don't have videos, photos, or audio recordings. For all I know, they could have been playing Scrabble. Richard hates Scrabble. We both shared a small laugh. A few moments of silence followed. I felt uncomfortable, having not shaved or cleaned up for days. Amelia was perfect in every way. She looked even better now than she had in college. She had transformed from an awkward adolescent into a beautiful woman. Richard had everything, power, status, a family, and a wonderful wife. Why did he have to steal mine? Amelia stood up, signaling the end of our conversation. Can I visit you again, George? Absolutely. I would enjoy that. 
She left, and I felt a pang of sadness. I had threatened her children's lives in front of the whole world, and she never raised her voice at me or showed any anger. It was as if she understood why I did it. Two hours later, I was escorted from the federal building and taken home. They unceremoniously dropped me off in front of my house and left without a word or explanation. The house was empty. All of Ellie's things were gone. I had no idea where her car was. I disconnected the phone and spent the next few days watching television. I got a perverse guilty pleasure from witnessing the chaos I had caused. For some reason, the media seemed more interested in the affair than in my threats. After two days of isolation, I finally called my parents to let them know everything was okay. On my first trip out of the house, I bought two six-packs of beer and ten frozen TV dinners. I waited until the last of the photographers had left. Hopefully, my 15 minutes of fame were over. I contemplated reaching out to Ellie's family, her parents or sisters, to find her, but I lacked a valid reason. Ultimately, I chose to wait and maintain a low profile. I had a decent sum of money tucked away in an overseas bank account, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. The funds in my local bank would sustain me for a few more months, but after that, I would need to make some serious lifestyle decisions. How would I earn a living? The answer would soon arrive from an unexpected source. Richard Taylor was no longer his party's favored candidate for re-election, and he did not handle the news well. While most media outlets downplayed his objections and outbursts, Fox News amplified them. The more he ranted, the more Fox egged him on. His major blunder came when he directed his anger at his wife, Amelia, who ended his tirade with an eight-inch kitchen knife to his chest. There was ample evidence supporting her claim of self-defense, including testimony from the nanny who witnessed the incident. However, the situation quickly became complicated, creating turmoil for Amelia and a nightmare for her children. Two days later, a small, unassuming car picked me up from my house and drove me to Bethesda. An assistant from the law firm Robinson, Robinson, and Carter informed me that they needed to discuss an urgent matter with me and offered no further details. The invitation was intriguing, so I accepted. We bypassed the main entrance, parking at the back and entering through a fire exit. The room I was led into didn't have the upscale feel reserved for high-end clients. It felt more like a pro bono setup, which seemed unusual. Mr. Nelson, I'm Mark Walker. I've been selected to present a special offer to you. He was corpulent and sweating profusely despite the moderate temperature. I estimated he was around 50, with thinning hair combed over and a face flushed with a rosy hue. What do you mean you were selected? I asked, noting his odd phraseology rather than the offer itself. He shot me a quizzical glance, seemingly puzzled by my focus on his wording rather than the proposal. Why are we meeting in this small room, Mr. Walker? It feels like you're trying to keep me hidden. You're very perceptive, Mr. Nelson. We've been instructed to keep this meeting discreet. Let's just say, no one is meant to know you're here. So, you're a specialist in handling low-key clients. He didn't respond. Instead, he opened the folder in front of him. Do you know where Nihau is? He asked. Yes, actually I do. I've never been there, but I know very few people have. Amelia Taylor owns, or rather leases, a small home on Naiha. That doesn't add up. Naiha is a restricted island. I thought only a few natives and the owners lived there. That's correct. Some exceptions have indeed been made for Amelia Taylor. All right, you've got my attention. What does Amelia Taylor and the island of Naiha have to do with me? The trial is not going well. It's a complete mess and only getting worse. Richard's family is sparing no expense to ensure Amelia is thoroughly penalized. She's worried about the toll this will take on her children and wants to protect them from it. And how am I involved in this? Amelia is sending her children to Neha until things settle down. It's the only place she believes they will be insulated from the chaos. She wants you to accompany them. You must be joking. I'm the one who threatened them. I'm the last person who should be trusted with these kids. We're as puzzled as you are. We don't understand why she chose you. I was taken aback. This didn't add up. Sure, I would never harm the children, but I barely knew them. We only crossed paths at occasional events and never really connected. 
What about Amelia's parents? Her father suffers from Alzheimer's, and her mother is consumed with his care. Plus, the children would still be hounded by the media if they stayed there. Why Nihau? There's no electricity, no running water, not even a school or a grocery store. Precisely. I'm sorry, Mr. Walker, but I have zero experience in caring for children. You've got the wrong guy. You won't be directly caring for them. Their nanny will be there to handle everything. What exactly does everything entail? She'll take care of the cooking, cleaning, and housekeeping. All right, then what am I supposed to do? Mr. Walker appeared somewhat perplexed by the question. I don't have a concrete answer. Amelia insisted on your presence without much explanation. I suspect she wants you to homeschool them to avoid sending them to a school on another island. She also seems to value having a male influence around. For some reason, she holds you in high regard. What do you mean by that? Pardon. You said she seems to think highly of me for some reason. What exactly do you mean? We're all a bit mystified by her choice. All we know about you, Mr. Nelson, is what's been reported in the media and some basic background information. The company never fully grasped why she selected you. I didn't mean to offend you. Please don't misunderstand my words. Can I have some coffee? Mark got up from his seat and left the room, giving me a few moments to gather my thoughts. Amelia's behavior puzzled me. Was she out of her mind or exceptionally shrewd? Known for her composure and strategic thinking, I had to trust that she picked me for a reason. The rationale behind her choice was still unclear, but that didn't seem urgent, yet. The coffee's aroma was more enticing than its taste. What's in it for me? Why would I agree to something so absurd? She banked on you feeling guilty about your actions and explicitly stated she wanted to leverage that. She actually said that. Yes, she did. Additionally, she proposed a weekly payment of $2,000, directly deposited into your Cayman account. You know about my Cayman account. We know everything. There's not much to uncover. You're quite the ordinary man, Mr. Nelson. If I accept, when do I have to leave? A private jet departs from Dallas at noon tomorrow. Our team will assist you in preparing and managing your home and personal matters in your absence. I had little knowledge about airplanes, but I knew enough to recognize it wasn't a 747. It was likely large enough to make the trip across the Pacific to Hawaii, implying its suitability for the journey. My escort took care of loading my bags while I stood around, trying to project some semblance of confidence, which I thoroughly lacked. I had packed what I thought would be essentials, though a guide would have been helpful. The island had no electricity, based on the information I found online, which seemed outdated and unpromising. I brought along my cell phone and charger, as well as my laptop, but I had no clue how to power these devices without electricity. I regretted not learning more about solar energy, and wondered about the reliability of my satellite cell phone service. By the time I was utterly confused, the limo arrived with the primary passengers. There were two boys and a girl. Paul, the eldest boy, appeared to be about 16, Layla was at least a year older, and Joshua seemed to be around 12. Introducing myself, I was pleasantly surprised by how courteous and well-mannered they were. Typically, I don't care much for children. Everything seemed fine until I met the nanny. Grace seemed to be from Central America, standing barely five feet tall. Although I guessed she wasn't yet 30, she looked older, I was notoriously bad at guessing women's ages. She ignored me as if I had a contagious disease, and her piercing stare haunted me throughout the trip. It was evident that I wasn't her ideal companion for this journey. Amelia's rationale for choosing me remained a perplexing mystery. Grace managed the children like a strict instructor, yet they obeyed her not out of fear but genuine respect and willingness. I was genuinely impressed. After the excitement of the takeoff died down, I made an effort to build some rapport with each of the kids. I figured it would make things smoother if I knew their likes and dislikes. I quickly realized that they were fully aware of the threat I had made and understood my reasons for it. However, they didn't seem to fear me. It was clear Grace knew too, as she never took her eyes off me. Paul had a keen interest in computers and anything tech-related. 
He seemed disappointed when he learned that Nihal lacked electricity. His eyes brightened a bit when I told him I had smuggled my laptop aboard. He responded positively when I asked if he knew anything about solar power or satellite communications. I had a feeling Paul and I would get along just fine. Layla was eager to swim and learn how to surf. Her biggest concern was whether we'd be near a beach suitable for swimming. I promised to help her find a way to get to the water, though I admitted I couldn't help her surf. We shared a laugh about that. She also hoped to go horseback riding. Joshua was upset about the absence of snakes on the islands. He had been looking forward to collecting various critters. When he mentioned this, I told him I was thankful that Street Patrick had banished all the snakes. He took great pleasure in correcting me. I knew I wouldn't get a chance to talk with Grace directly. Her facial expressions and gestures made it clear she wanted nothing to do with me. It was obvious she did not appreciate me interacting with the children. I found myself watching her as she slept. Her skin had a bronze hue with a slight sheen. Her lips and nose were a bit flatter and broader than average. Her dark, heavy eyebrows framed deep, dark eyes I couldn't forget. She was striking, exotic, and very intriguing. We stopped in Seattle and had supper at the airport while the plane refueled. To my surprise, Grace spoke perfect English with no accent. Though she hadn't spoken to me, I noticed her when she talked to the children. She was becoming more intriguing as the flight progressed. The children slept the entire way from Seattle to the islands. Grace slept part of the time, but when she was awake, she often watched me. She clearly knew about the letter and seemed more concerned about it than the children. The next leg of our journey involved a seaplane, which the kids found thrilling. This experience was topped by a helicopter ride directly to Nehau. A small group of people awaited our arrival, and I tried to stay in the background. It was clear they wanted to keep everything low-key. Two hours later, a jeep like Chitney dropped us off at our new home. It was a typical island bungalow with a few upgrades. As the kids and Myra rushed inside, I walked around the building. It had a metal roof with large enclosed gutters for collecting rainwater. From my research, I knew Naiha was relatively dry. A system like this would only be installed if it were cost-effective. The collected water was funneled into three large fiberglass tanks mounted high under the roof on the west side of the building. The entire south side of the roof was covered with solar panels. There seemed to be three different types, but all shared the same tilt angle. I was intrigued to learn how the solar energy was being utilized. Joshua was captivated by a small flock of free-range chickens gathered around a raised coop in the backyard. It was clear that eggs would be plentiful, even if bacon was not on the menu. Trying to remain inconspicuous, I observed the man who had dropped us off as he finished explaining things to Grace. He mentioned that he would bring groceries and other supplies every Tuesday morning and handed Grace some forms for the following week's orders. I decided to stay out of it, letting Grace handle the details, as she was the professional. I still had no clue why I was here. Out back, there was a propane tank scheduled for monthly checks and refills. Apart from the propane stove, there was an antique propane-powered refrigerator, a rare sight since my childhood. There seemed to be an abundance of fresh fruit and vegetables. Paul declared he had claimed the small bedroom on the south side of the house, which had a door leading to the battery storage area for the solar panels. My initial concern faded upon noticing the area was well ventilated. Along with the batteries, there was a complex array of wiring and switches. Though it looked intimidating to me, it captivated Paul, who was eager to dive in. I ended up sharing a room with Joshua, which he found exciting. Grace wasn't thrilled about it, but there was no alternative. She certainly didn't offer to share her space, nor did I expect her to. For supper, Grace set up a small buffet of fresh fruit. Not in the mood to cook, which I completely understood. Shortly after eating, Joshua fell asleep on the sofa, and the rest of us were ready for bed. About half an hour later, a small scream pierced the quiet. Grace had been the first to brave the unheated shower. Finding out this was the cause relieved me and made me chuckle a bit. By the time I woke up, Grace had already prepared breakfast, fruit and eggs with fresh juice. Joshua was beaming, proud of having collected the eggs himself. Grace had no trouble assigning him this task for every morning.
Shaving with cold water and enduring a cool shower was far from pleasant. The water wasn't ice cold, but it lacked any warmth. I also realized I needed new clothes if I were to stay here longer. After finishing my morning routine, I found myself alone in the house. I stood on the porch, gazing out over the valley before me. The ocean was closer than I initially thought. At the bottom of the hill, I could spot Grace with Layla and Joshua. Paul was not with them. I watched as they left the road and crossed the rocks and sand toward the water. Joshua was wandering aimlessly, while Layla walked straight into the surf and stood still. They were nearly a mile away, so I could only see their basic movements. Grace sat on a rock outcropping, observing them. My attention shifted toward the house as I heard noises from the back. Inside, I found Paul in the battery room, deeply engaged with a clipboard. He was so focused he didn't seem to notice my entrance. A quick glance revealed he was drafting a schematic of the house's wiring and equipment. I felt a bit relieved that he had found something to occupy himself. Mr. Nelson, what type of cell phone service do you have? He must have heard me come in after all. It's Verizon. I brought it along, hoping we could get satellite reception. Is it internet capable? Yes, it has internet, email, GPS, and texting. I don't use most of its features, but it does everything. Do you mind if I use it for a while? I intended to use it for emergencies since we don't have a way to recharge it. Paul smiled broadly. No problem. It looks like we'll be able to recharge anything by the end of the day. Do you need the laptop too? Not until tomorrow. I should be able to connect the laptop to the internet through the cell phone. Do you have an unlimited service plan? I went to get the laptop and cell phone. When I returned, Paul had moved into his room, where he had a desk set up against the wall adjoining the battery room. I wasn't sure where he had gotten the desk. He placed the items on the desk and continued working on his drawings. I have to order a bunch of stuff to get us set up. Don't worry, I have my own PayPal account. The mail won't be here until next Tuesday, but I have plenty to do until then. I had nothing to add. Paul clearly knew what he was doing, and there was little I could contribute. As I turned to leave, I heard him say, By the way, that third section of solar panels isn't for power collection. It's a solar-based hot water system. It should work once I get a DC pump with enough lift. Do you want to work on that? Crafty little bugger. He had taken control of the situation and was already delegating tasks. I just smiled and nodded, leaving him to his work. I needed something to do, and the hot water system sounded intriguing. Grace, Layla, and Joshua lingered by the water, a brief ten-minute walk from the bungalow. Joshua was engrossed in examining tidal pools for marine life. Layla meandered further down the beach but remained within sight. I decided to sit beside Grace, only to be met with a look that clearly conveyed my presence was unwelcome. I considered striking up a conversation but quickly dismissed the idea, forcing it would be futile. Grace's disdain for me was palpable and unreserved. We stayed in strained silence until Layla returned, at which point we all headed back to the bungalow. Joshua, clearly enthralled by the tidal pools, would have stayed all day but promptly obeyed when Grace called him. During the walk back, Joshua talked incessantly while Grace maintained her silence, and Layla made only one comment, I need to find a surfboard somewhere. Routine gradually settled in. Joshua would rise early every day, embarking on explorations, initially of the tidal pools and later venturing into the nearby jungle-like areas. The islands were devoid of poisonous snakes or dangerous animals, so I had no concerns for his safety. Surprisingly, Grace seemed equally unconcerned. Though Grace remained distant, she at least communicated for necessary tasks. I accepted the situation without pushing. Her skin, shimmering in the sunlight, added to her mystique. Paul lived in his own chaotic world, his desk a jumble of wires and makeshift devices. The cell phone now permanently wired into the solar electrical system provided us with global phone service and internet access through the phone. I kept my distance, knowing I wasn't equipped to offer any help. Layla, using her charm, convinced Paul to make a call, and by the next morning, she had her surfboard. Her days were now spent at the beach, self-teaching the art of surfing. 
Evenings were for watching surf tutorials Paul found online. However, Grace refused to let Layla go to the water alone, creating a new dilemma. After three days, Grace finally approached me for more than just functional communication. Mr. Nelson, it's difficult for me to say this, but I need your help. Her words grabbed my attention, and I sat, anticipating what would come next. Somehow, Grace seemed more beautiful each day. I have washing, cleaning, cooking, and other housework that needs to be done. I can't continue to sit by the beach with Layla all day, but I can't leave her alone. You want me to start doing the housework? I asked, prompting a frustrated smirk from her. No, I need you to watch Layla while I handle the chores. I'm not happy about leaving you alone with any of them, but I have no other choice. What's your problem with me? Is there anything I can explain to help you feel better about this situation? I read the letter, Mr. Nelson. The last thing I want is to leave you with them. Mrs. Taylor believes you pose no threat and told me to trust you. I don't understand why, but I don't really know you. I have to do my job, even if it's against my will. She was right. I did my best to appear sincere. Grace, I would never do anything to harm the children. When I wrote that letter, I was in pain. It was a terrible act, but I was desperate. My marriage had just fallen apart, and I was bitter. Amelia asked me to come here for a reason, something likely related to the kids. I'll figure it out. Meanwhile, I am willing to do anything to help and earn your trust. Good. You start tomorrow, right after the delivery. What delivery? We're expecting a truckload of mail, food, supplies, and things Paul ordered. Next week, we'll receive a larger shipment of clothing and personal items that couldn't come with us on the plane. Some of it will be from your apartment. How do you know all of this? I talk to the island supervisor daily, as well as Mr. Walker. Paul has arranged everything so I can keep track of what's happening. Things will improve next week in case there's something you need or need to address. I had nothing else to say. She was smart, competent, and well-organized. The warm climate and humidity made her bronze skin glow, contrasting with her long black hair. Lately, her more casual attire showcased her full figure. I was still mystified by her perfect diction. I have to prepare supper, she said, turning to go. I assumed our conversation was over. She paused and added, Oh, by the way, I expect hot water in that shower by next week. We both smiled. It was the first time we shared a smile, and it made me feel better about our relationship. Tuesday morning felt like Christmas. Instead of the usual Jeep, a small Isuzu truck arrived. Several boxes were for me, but most were for the kids. Grace received generic vegetables and fruit, not looking particularly pleased. She had a list ready for next week, including staples and food items she wanted. Paul received the most items. Packages of all sizes and shapes, from various sources, caused him to grin from ear to ear as he moved his treasures into his room. I was dying to see what he had planned. The mail was placed on top of the refrigerator for later. Before our delivery man could leave, Layla pulled him aside and whispered something. Grace didn't notice. Our island Santa smiled and waved to Layla as he left. I was ready for our daily trek to the beach when Layla informed me she wasn't going. She wanted to inventory her new things and arrange her room. That was fine until Paul came out and handed me a package. This one is for you, Mr. Nelson, he said, handing over the DC water pump. I couldn't help but chuckle. I really needed to get everyone to start using my first name. All the wiring and PVC plumbing fixtures you need are in the battery room, he added before walking away. The moment felt oddly reminiscent of prepping for a high school science project. As I made my way to the back of the house, I passed Grace and couldn't suppress a giggle. Once this is set up, I'll need your help to test it, I said to her. She looked surprised, then smiled and playfully hit my shoulder as I walked by. Things were definitely starting to look up. I'll spare you the technical details of connecting the water pump to the solar collector. Let's just say it involved a lot of swearing on my part and some giggles from Paul's room. I got so engrossed in the installation that I skipped lunch. The pump's job was simple. It carried water to the top of the solar panels and let it trickle down for shower use. While it didn't make the water scalding hot, it certainly made it more comfortable. Joshua was eager to be the first to try it out. 
It wouldn't be effective at night or during overcast, rainy days, but I was relieved that it worked at all. My mind started racing with ideas for other projects. While checking the water fittings on the roof, I realized someone was using the shower, making it easier to spot leaks. When I came back down, Grace emerged from the shower wrapped in a towel. She gave me an embarrassed glance before ducking into her room. The effort had been worth it if it made her happy. In the subsequent days, things continued to improve. Out of the blue, a local boy named Charles, around 17, showed up. Apparently, Layla had asked the delivery man if he knew anyone who could teach her how to surf, and he recommended Charles, who lived about three miles from the beach. The two hit it off immediately. Though I wasn't thrilled about being a chaperone, I realized it was necessary. Layla looked great in her swimsuit, and my role had shifted from merely ensuring her safety to also being responsible for her virtue. I told Grace about the situation that evening. She was not pleased. Meanwhile, Paul was busy impressing everyone with his skills and knowledge. In just a few days, he had set up a complete computer system, including a printer and an internet phone. I wished I could have my cell phone back, but Paul needed it for the internet connection. He assured me he was working on it. Joshua had shifted his focus from the tidal pools to exploring the undergrowth, and for some reason, neither Grace nor I were worried about him. Layla, however, was a different story. She wasn't doing anything wrong, it was just that she was a beautiful young girl with a great body spending every day with an island surfer boy. I hate to resort to stereotypes, but that was the most straightforward way to describe Charles. He seemed likable enough, except for the fact that he was likely a hormonal teenage boy. Layla shouldn't have been flirting and leading him on, but she was a teenager herself, with all the accompanying emotions and impulses. Grace and I had started conversing regularly, mainly about the kids or the house. While she seemed to be warming up to me, she remained cautious. She wasn't pleased with how I had handled the situation between Layla and Charles, blaming me for not supervising them closely enough, and she had a point. A sizable package arrived, filled with homeschooling supplies. Joshua was less than thrilled, but Paul and Layla showed some interest. With Layla set to leave for college before year's end, and Paul accelerating toward his own academic goals, their mother had multiple plans in motion regarding their higher education. I decided it was best to stay out of it, though Grace did ask me to help by organizing a formal schedule for studying and testing. I finally got my cell phone back thanks to Paul, who managed to integrate all of his electronic devices, including internet access. He sourced a satellite internet receiver that operated on DC and set up an electronic panel in his room to manage and recharge any DC-powered appliance. The first call I made was to my parents, who reported that everything was fine at home, although they hadn't seen or heard from Ellie. With few alternatives, I reached out to Mark Walker for an update. Unfortunately, Walker informed me that he couldn't help me move out of my apartment because Ellie had moved back in, which was troubling news. Layla decided to tackle her studying in the morning, leaving the afternoons free for surfing. She and Charles often disappeared behind some rock formations, seemingly to tease me. I usually ignored their antics, but one day my curiosity got the better of me. Thanks to having my cell phone back, I managed to snap a few incriminating photos of them sharing kisses and more. Layla still had her bikini on, but that didn't stop Charles from exploring. A discreet cough from me ended their fun, and I walked home with an embarrassed Layla. When Grace saw the photos, she became convinced that my suspicions about Layla were spot on. Shortly after, I noticed her having a private conversation with Layla on the back lanai. I was relieved Grace was handling it, as it wasn't a discussion I wanted to initiate. Post-conversation, Grace delivered a scathing reprimand to me for my lax supervision of Layla, one I wouldn't forget any time soon. Meanwhile, Paul had surprisingly completed all his school assignments and tests, reaching out to the admissions departments of several schools. His diligence impressed me. On the other hand, Joshua's behavior was becoming odd, after his afternoon outings, he'd retreat to his room, filling it with notes and drawings. Paul had given him a small digital camera and taught him how to upload photos into the new desktop computer that had mysteriously appeared. Every room was equipped with DC appliance plugs, and Joshua's computer included a small scanner, 
He was becoming a geek like Paul, but his interests skewed more towards biology than electronics. I also got my laptop back, coinciding with the arrival of a DC-powered HDTV, making our setup quite impressive. However, I still found myself wishing for a microwave oven every now and then. For the next few weeks, life settled into a fairly normal rhythm. A highlight for me was when Grace admitted she no longer believed I intended to harm the children. She didn't elaborate, and I didn't press further. Finally, Layla celebrated her 18th birthday. Then everything began changing rapidly. The first shift came when Grace informed me I no longer needed to accompany Layla to the beach. I don't understand, Grace. You were so worried about her safety, and then her relationship with Charles. What's changed? I have a lot of confidence in Charles, Grace replied. He knows the water and wave actions well. I believe he can keep Layla safe. I don't think she'll come to any harm with him around. Come on, Grace, you know what's happening between them. There's no way you can leave them alone on a secluded beach. You know exactly what's going to happen. Grace put down the laundry she was folding and looked at me. It's too late, George. Her calling me by my first name caught me off guard. What does that mean? It means you did a lousy job as a chaperone. She sighed, looking as though she had failed at something critical. They're already sleeping together. We can't stop it now. I remember being young once. We might as well let them figure things out and stop frustrating ourselves. What if she gets pregnant? What will you tell Amelia? I got Layla started on birth control pills a few weeks ago. I also spoke to Mrs. Taylor about it. She understands and thinks it's normal and healthy. How did you get her a prescription for the pills? And why didn't you tell me that you were in contact with their mother? Grace grabbed her folded laundry and walked out of the room. I don't want to discuss this anymore. There are several roof panels that need to be fastened down. See if you can get it done before supper and whatever you do, don't fall off the roof. I had been dismissed. It was clear Grace had shared all the information she was going to. I had just started to feel comfortable with the situation, and now I felt like an outsider once more. I spent the afternoon hammering on the roof, moping about my inability to manage my own affairs. I remained quiet and sullen during dinner. Layla seemed happier than usual, for obvious reasons. Paul and Joshua were the same as ever. Grace noticed my discontent, and when the children weren't looking, stuck her tongue out at me, following it with a small smile. I spent the rest of the evening bewildered. With my duties as Layla's chaperone lifted, I suddenly had more time to work around the house. Whenever I needed parts or tools, I jot them down on the list Grace kept on the refrigerator. Despite my efforts, I struggled to understand my role in the household. The kids managed their own schooling, Grace handled the house duties, and all I seemed to do was play Mr. Fix-It. After one of our evening meals, Joshua made a remark that caught my attention. He glanced over at Paul and said, I miss Nora. She was a much better cook than Grace. There was a brief discussion about the food preparation, but my curiosity was piqued about who Nora was and why she wasn't with us. I tucked the thought away in my already cluttered mind. It wasn't pressing enough to dwell on, but I wanted to remember it. I suppose I could have asked one of the kids directly about Nora, but I didn't feel comfortable doing so. Out of the blue, Paul received an acceptance letter from MIT. He was set to start classes in four weeks. Apparently, all the arrangements had been made without my knowledge. I guess I wasn't in the loop. I insisted that before he left, he needed to prepare a manual explaining the house's electrical system in a way that I could understand. He saw it as a good challenge and got right to work. He also helped Layla prepare for her final exams and submit some college applications. I was left thoroughly puzzled. If Amelia was willing to let the kids leave the island's safety to attend college, why had we been sent here in the first place? What were the kids being protected from? I felt like an idiot for threatening them earlier, only to be ignored. I assumed the island was meant to shield them from the grim news about their father's death and their mother's prosecution, but with our TV and internet access, that theory didn't hold up. My presence seemed superficial at best. Grace even laughed when she saw I had added a six-pack of beer to the supply list. Things took a turn on the night of the monsoon. It was probably just a big storm, but we all called it a monsoon, 
It had rained all day, and Joshua hadn't made it back for supper. Grace and I left Layla and Paul at the house and went looking for him. The relentless rain had turned everything into a muddy mess. Knowing Joshua's favorite spot was in a deep ravine just south of the house, we headed there and found him stuck. The steep sides of the gully were normally no challenge for him, but the rain had turned footholds into slick mud. Grace immediately slipped and fell into the mud, soaked by the rain. I couldn't help but notice her large brown nipples peeking through her thin, wet t-shirt as she wasn't wearing a bra. While distracted, I lost my footing and landed beside the wet and muddy Guatemalan beauty. Joshua was laughing his head off, covered in the same sticky mud but seemingly unfazed by it. It took us about ten minutes to pull him out of the hole. Grace scolded him a bit, but nothing he didn't deserve. I was just relieved we found him safe, and a bit amused that Grace wasn't wearing a bra. Oh, did I mention that before? The rain helped wash off some of the dirt before we returned home, but not all of it. Grace insisted we leave our shoes outside and then hurry Joshua into the shower. He passed his muddy clothes to her, and in exchange, she handed him a towel. Layla then escorted him to his room. Unexpectedly, I decided to join Grace in the shower. She was still clothed when I entered. Initially surprised, she soon relaxed and turned her back to me. I squirted shampoo on her head and began washing her hair. She stood still, seemingly holding her breath, but after a few moments, she exhaled and started to breathe normally, moving her head to make it easier for me. When it was time to rinse the suds out, I turned her around and she didn't resist. As I gently pulled her shirt off, she raised her arms. While I washed her body, she began undressing me. In a matter of minutes, we were both naked. We then spent ten wonderful minutes making each other happy. Just as well it didn't take longer, as Brian soon began banging on the door, asking if everything was okay. I left the bathroom first, wrapping a towel around myself. Passing Layla and Paul in the living room, I noticed them giggling, unsure if it was a good or bad sign. At that moment, though, I felt great. When I got to the room, Joshua was fast asleep, likely exhausted from the day's activities. Planning to lie down for just a minute, I ended up sleeping until the next morning. I expected to see a cheerful Grace in the morning, but she was grumpy instead. Puzzled, I didn't discuss it with the kids around. After a while, Layla, Paul, and Joshua left, leaving Grace and me alone. Grace, I'm confused. You seem a little off. Did I do something wrong? If I did, I'm sorry. I had no intention of forcing you into anything. She put down the dish she was drying. No, you didn't do anything wrong. I did. I'm sorry you feel that way. It won't happen again. She slammed her hand on the counter. No, damn it. That's not it. It's not you or anything you did. I don't understand. Grace retrieved two fresh cups of coffee and sat down at the table with me. Remember when I talked to Layla about two weeks ago? The day you caught her kissing Terry. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. What went wrong? I gave Layla my birth control pills. I wasn't using them or planning to. I thought she might need them more. At the time, I didn't expect anything to happen between us. Taking a big swig of too hot coffee, I asked, Are you saying there's a chance that... She cut me off. Don't even say it or think it. I won't know anything for a few weeks. In the meantime, keep that thing in your pants. She noticed I looked a bit dejected. At least until I can get more pills. A faint smile crossed her face as she turned back toward the sink. For some inexplicable reason, I found myself hoping she was pregnant. I hardly knew this woman, yet the idea of being the father of her child filled me with excitement. It was a feeling I couldn't quite understand. Joshua and I spent most of the day replacing the roof on the chicken shed. The ground was too muddy for him to visit his sanctuary. Despite the hard work, I was in a good mood all day. We occasionally watched the news, so it took us completely by surprise when, a week later, Amelia Taylor appeared at our doorstep. Feeling like an outsider, I stayed in the background, allowing her to reconnect with her children. Grace pulled me aside and briefly explained what had happened. The prosecuting attorney had quietly dropped all charges against Amelia, and she was released with minimal publicity. She came straight here to reunite with her children and hide from the press. 
Apparently, she did a good job because, according to the news, everyone was speculating about her whereabouts. Significant forensic evidence was collected immediately after the murder, but none of it was tampered with or planted, and none of it directly implicated Amelia. The prosecutor struggled to tie any evidence to her. Amelia's attorney remained silent throughout the process, not protesting or pushing for the case to be dropped. They simply waited for the case to fall apart, which it eventually did. She spent all that time in jail when she probably could have been released sooner. I couldn't help but wonder what all this had to do with me and why I was here. The jeep that had brought Amelia to the house was still parked outside. As Grace and I sat on the front porch, the kids began gathering their things from the house. Amelia finally approached us. I really want to thank you both for all your help. I couldn't have done it without you, she said, her gratitude evident. Grace quickly responded, Mrs. Taylor, Nora, and I can never thank you enough for everything you've done. We owe you a great debt. I felt like a complete dunce, unable to understand any of it. There was that name again, Nora. Who the hell was Nora, and what did she have to do with all this? Did you enjoy yourself, George? Amelia asked, catching me off guard. I regained my composure and replied, yes, I guess so. You're not sure, she pressed. Amelia, I began, I never figured out why I was here or what I was supposed to do. Since you're here, maybe you can explain. Before she could answer, the three kids came bounding out of the house, tossing their bags into the jeep. Grace, we're heading to the big island for about a week. I'll leave you here with George to rest up. When we get back, we can discuss what's next, and I'll give George an explanation. Amelia said as she climbed into the jeep with the kids. They all waved and a moment later, they were gone. I glanced over at Grace, noticing the catinish smile creeping across her face. Her grin left me puzzled. Do you want to go in and mess around? The words were barely believable, but I heard them clear as day. Did you get your new pills? No, silly. I'm pregnant. No sense in worrying about the pills now. We spent most of the day in bed, and for that, I was grateful I decided to take this trip. Dinner that evening was quiet without the kids around. In fact, the silence stretched between Grace and me as well. Despite an entire afternoon of intimacy, there remained a distance. So many questions lingered unanswered. Here I was with a woman I cared about deeply and wanted to have a child with, yet I realized how little I truly knew about her. It was difficult to articulate. Grace, who is Nora? My sister. Her reply was concise, leaving much to interpretation. What role did she play in the family beyond just being your sister? Grace rose from the table to fetch me a bottle of my cherished beer. Nora and I both worked for Mrs. Taylor. Nora handled the cooking while I cared for the children and took care of the house. Where is she now? Grace retrieved a beer for herself. George, I'm not trying to be evasive. I want to tell you everything, but it's complicated. Her voice carried a hint of distress, and I immediately regretted pushing too hard. Despite my intentions, I'd upset her, leaving me feeling guilty and hurt by her secrecy. She poured her beer into a glass. George, what's the status of your marriage? What I really mean is, will you still be married when all of this is over? I thought she was going to file for divorce when she left, but she hasn't, and I don't know why. As of now, I have no idea what's going on. If she doesn't file soon, I will. It's hard to manage anything or know what's happening from here. The beer tasted refreshing, albeit slightly warm. Why do you speak perfect English with no accent if you're from Guatemala? I've been in the States since I was three. Nora and I learned English from watching Sesame Street. Our conversation flowed smoothly, and I hoped to maintain this rhythm, though I often had a knack for saying the wrong thing. Why didn't you kill Mr. Taylor, George? Can I have another beer? I handed her my empty bottle. Grace, I felt more hurt and humiliated than vengeful. I was angry, but not enough to kill. She gave me a new bottle. This is the last one. Savor it. George, are you happy that I'm having a baby, or are you upset? I'm very happy about the baby, but I'm worried about what will happen between us. That's a good answer. A brief silence followed. I knew she had more questions. I certainly did. It was time to tread carefully. 
Grace, what did Nora do, and why isn't she with us? Before I knew it, I was alone in the kitchen. Grace had stormed out of the room and out of the house. After finishing the cleanup from supper, I stepped onto the front porch. There she was, sitting on the top step, gazing at the sunset. It was a beautiful sight, but her eyes were filled with tears. I joined her silently. For at least ten minutes, we watched the last rays of daylight disappear below the horizon in quiet companionship. Finally, she looked at me and took my hand. George, Mrs. Taylor didn't kill her husband. Nora did. He was beating on Mrs. Taylor and wouldn't stop, so Nora grabbed the knife and stabbed him in the chest. Mrs. Taylor told the police it was her fault, so Nora could escape. I believe Nora is back in Guatemala, but I'm not sure. Mrs. Taylor never admitted to actually killing him, she just took the blame. That's why the police had to prove it. I pulled Grace close and kissed the side of her head, a gesture of comfort, not passion. We stayed on the porch a few more minutes in silence before heading to bed. That night, we simply slept in. The next day, we tried to maintain normalcy, but without the kids, it felt off. I received an email from Walker that simply said, Check the Drudge Report. Uncertain what I was looking for, I eventually found it. Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, Thomas Turner, was found shot to death this morning in Warrenton, Virginia. Police discovered his body in a hot tub alongside Ellie Nelson, a public relations analyst for an Alexandria consulting firm. Both victims had been shot multiple times at close range. The shootings were reported by Mildred Turner, the victim's wife, who awaited the police when they arrived. Mrs. Turner was taken into custody pending charges. Ellie Nelson had also been linked to Richard Taylor, who was killed earlier this year. I printed the news article and handed it to Grace, then walked away without waiting to see her reaction. Evidently, Ellie had an affinity for politicians, but I wished she had been a bit more discreet. I called my parents, who informed me that Ellie's family was already en route to retrieve her body. I felt a pang of sorrow for them. They were good people who didn't deserve this tragedy. Though I had once loved Ellie, I couldn't help but feel grief at her demise. Upon returning to Naiha, Amelia already knew about Ellie's death. She found time to sit down and talk with me, taking an hour to explain the circumstances surrounding Richard's death. Yet, despite repeated questioning, she sidestepped the reason for sending me here. Realizing she wouldn't provide an answer, I gave up trying. Everyone was heading back to the States. Paul was set to begin his studies at MIT, while Layla had secured early admission to the University of Hawaii. She managed to persuade her mother that being near the surf was important for her well-being. The real challenge was Joshua and Amelia. Joshua was adamantly against leaving Naiha. At just 12 years old, he was reluctant to leave his home. Though he had no say in the matter, his mother Amelia was willing to compromise on one condition. Grace and I had to agree to stay on Nahal until Joshua was ready for college. Under the agreement, Joshua would spend summers and any extended vacations with us, but would stay with his mother during the rest of the year. I wasn't sure what salary Grace was making, but mine was about to be drastically cut, from $2,000 a week to $1,000 a month. Despite the significant pay reduction, I would still receive compensation and have a free place to stay, with the added benefit of keeping my own little private retreat. Things were looking up, especially since I now had access to the funds I had hidden in the Caymans. That evening, Amelia cooked dinner for everyone while Grace and I took a walk down to the beach to have a private discussion. It was a serious decision that required thoughtful consideration, but we arrived at a conclusion pretty swiftly, within five minutes. A week later, Grace and I found ourselves alone on the island. We missed the kids, but they promised to stay in touch. Charles dropped by once. He seemed a bit down until I mentioned that Layla would be starting at the University of Hawaii soon. After that, we didn't see him again, but he left looking happier. When I sold my business, the contract didn't include a non-compete clause, allowing me to continue my work as long as I avoided contacting my former clients. Paul had left me a neat computer setup, getting my new business operational within a week. A month later, Walker informed me that Ellie had an insurance policy worth $500,000, and I was the sole beneficiary. Grace now dreams of having three more children.
Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.